Unfortunately, there are thousands of men, women, and children every day, every moment, becoming victims of violent crimes. Why, we're not even safe in our own homes anymore. That's right, but it doesn't have to be that way. Conservative journalist Andy No was out there covering rival protests on Saturday. Uh, protesters, uh, it appears to be Antifa protesters, uh, then attacked No. Uh, his critics say he's there to, to cause trouble, but that's unacceptable. Uh, the idea that he would be attacked, that he would be uh, bloodied in that way, uh, unacceptable, period. Very few people believe that violence is always wrong. And while there's a lot of disagreement about when violence is justified, most people agree, at least in principle, that self-defense is fine. If someone threatens my life or physical safety, I'm allowed to use violence to protect myself. But what level of threat justifies violence? How much violence am I allowed to use in response? Does violence deter future violence or make it more likely? These are the questions that this video will not even attempt to answer. Instead, let's uh, talk about Antifa again. As you may know from watching your television or reading the internet, Antifa has been known to occasionally do a violence against people they consider fascists. People who support Antifa will tell you that this sort of direct action is actually a form of self-defense. This seems weird to a lot of people, since this violence is often directed at individuals who seem to pose no immediate physical danger whatsoever, like Milo Yiannopoulos at a Berkeley speaking engagement, or Richard Spencer during a TV interview, or Andy Ngo as he reported on a Portland protest. And this should make us curious, because we don't live in a comic book universe populated by supervillains who want to destroy the world for funsies. By and large, People do what they do because they believe it's right, or at least they believe it isn't wrong. So what does Antifa believe? Why does Antifa, or more specifically the Black Bloc, which is a tactic used by some members of Antifa and not a specific group, even though the term is almost always used to refer to the group of people doing the tactic, which isn't at all confusing, this is fine. Why does the Black Bloc think that attacking public speakers and journalists constitutes self-defense? What threat do they believe these people pose? Does that threat justify direct physical violence? And does that violence actually work to protect people from whatever threat people like this pose? For questions like these, it helps to have an example. So we're going to focus on the Andy No milkshaking event of June 29th, 2019. I've chosen this example because A, it contains within it almost every element present across the entire swath of black block violence, B, the reachable right is less likely to accuse me of straw manning if I choose the gay Asian man instead of the white nationalist, and C, Andy No is still sort of trending right now. All hail the algorithm, driver of content, shaper of minds, all powerful god of the discourse, praise be- Also a lot of people criticized my last video for its failure to emphatically condemn the milkshaking. Well, I'm ready to set the record straight. People say the left doesn't care about Antifa's violent thuggery, but I'm ready to take a brave stand. Fox News, Breitbart, I'm ready to be silenced all the way onto primetime for my controversial opinion. Well, almost ready. I'm gonna need to put you on hold for just a moment so we can really explore why Antifa felt they needed to rob, beat, and milkshake a second generation immigrant who just wanted to do his job. Part one, who the fuck is Andy No? No's first brush with fame in 2017 came in the most 2017 way possible, a viral tweet. During a Portland State Interfaith panel, a Muslim panelist seemed to say that, in an Islamic state ruled by strict Quranic law, non-Muslims could legally be killed but would be given a choice to leave. The quote itself, which I link to in the description, is a bit convoluted, and it's worth noting that immediately after this statement, a Muslim in the audience stood up and explained to the crowd that this was an erroneous interpretation of Islamic law. 
No, a political science grad student and the multimedia editor for the Portland State University College paper used his personal Twitter account to tweet a video of the incident that cut off before this clarification, along with the sentence, Muslim student speaker said that apostates will be killed or banished in an Islamic state. Two and a half hours later, he tweeted a version of the video that included the second Muslim's correction, but by then it was too late. The tweet had already made it to the eyes and ears of Breitbart, which quickly wrote an entire article based almost exclusively on this single tweet. When Andy Noe was fired from the Portland State paper a few days later, the conservative outrage machine had a martyr along with their murderous Muslim, Jackpot. No rode that wave to moderate conservative acclaim and ultimately an editorship position at the new, provocative, edgy, brave hub for the intellectual dark web, Quillette. This incident also gave No a recipe he's used ever since. Create a video or article that depicts the most damning part of a given incident and leaves out context, spin criticism of his suspect editing into supposed proof that the left persecutes dissenters and attempts to silence opposition, and then ride the ensuing media scrum to increased visibility. No went on to bravely use his small platform mostly to speak out against the dangers of Islam and academic censorship and courageously refused to be intimidated or silenced by things like facts or the need to research one's claims. For example, on August 29, 2018, No published an opinion article in the Wall Street Journal that claimed to expose a Muslim takeover of Whitechapel, London. His evidence included, among other things, a lack of eye contact, scary hijabs, the presence of mosques, and signs forbidding the public consumption of alcohol, which is definitely a thing only Muslims do. Every other Western culture absolutely allows people to drink in public. New York City has apparently been an Islamic caliphate since 1979. Whitechapel resident Alex Lockie basically eviscerated every single one of No's points in a retort for Business Insider, massive side-eye was given, and the Wall Street Journal committed ritual seppuku on the steps of the Journalist Memorial in Washington, D.C. And by seppuku, I mean they didn't apologize at all, and just continued to turn out articles as though nothing had happened. Here's another gem from our man on the street. Did you see that video of Antifa in Portland going nuts on a car last October? A lot of people did, in large part due to Andy No's article about the incident in, once again, the Wall Street Journal. Didn't this used to be a real paper, or was that just a neoliberal fever dream? Anyway, the article fails to mention that the car in question turned against a walk sign into a crosswalk full of protesters legally crossing the street, and then pushed one protester about 20 feet before gunning it towards the waterfront. I'd be pretty mad, too, if that happened to me. If you're a local Portlander, you might remember the Cider Riot riot on May 1st, 2019. When a member of Patriot Prayer knocked a protester out cold, No tweeted that protester's full name, apparently in an effort to establish that they had participated in activism previously and therefore deserved to be knocked out? It's confusing. The point is he doxed them, revealed their identity, and made them a potential target for future violence. As an aside, he also had the gall to whine about getting pepper sprayed in the middle of the fight his side started, which, dude... There's no crying in starting a riot. If you're right of center, uh, first of all, thank you for watching this far, I love you, but more importantly, you might remember when Owen Lenahan published a very scientific chart in Quillette that definitively proved deep and significant connections between journalists who cover Antifa and members of Antifa themselves. By which I mean he showed that a lot of those journalists follow Antifa accounts on Twitter. You know, as you might expect from someone who covers that sort of thing. To be fair, I can see how certain individuals might be confused by this kind of responsible journalism. Now, No didn't write the article, but the article ran in his journal and cited him as a major source. Also, he sure did promote it. And he kept promoting it, and defending it, even after actual journalists discovered that not only was the study bullshit, but that Lenahan had none of the extremism expert credentials he claims. In fact, he's an established far-right troll with a history of chumming around with white nationalists and making jokes about Jews. Neat. This complete fabrication had some very serious real-world consequences. The article quickly made its way to Stormfront and inspired an Adam Waffen video that encouraged viewers to kill the journalists named in the article. If you weren't aware, both Stormfront and Adamwaffen are out neo-Nazi groups. 
Adam Vothen, seen here training for race war, has been linked to several deaths and bombing attempts. Stormfront has been linked to over 100 murders, so threats from this quarter carry extra weight. Luckily, none of the journalists have been attacked at the time of this video, but they live in constant fear for their lives and the lives of their families. They've scrubbed their internet presence, unlisted their addresses, and bought home security equipment. Best case scenario, these reporters will live in fear for years because of some lies promoted and published by Andy No. Here's the thing about No. He doesn't start the fire, but he's always on hand with a can of gasoline. When Tucker Carlson needs someone to come on TV and talk about the lawless wasteland that is Portland, Andy No is there. Got an edited, context-free video that seems to show Antifa as mindless thugs? Not only will No promote it, he'll double down on it after people call bullshit. Got a story that makes the right look violent and dangerous? He'll go on Fox News to explain why the left is lying about it. He's not a brawler, he won't punch you in the face, but he is a vital component of the conservative outrage machine. He's an amplifier, and his words have very real effects. Part 2. Milkshakes Andy No is an asshole, and a shitty journalist who purposefully spreads misinformation. That misinformation has real-world effects and puts real people in real danger. On June 29, 2019, No showed up at a Portland protest to videotape the action and, presumably, carry on his regular work of propaganda creation and doxing. Members of Antifa pelted him with milkshakes, stole his camera, and beat him up. No sustained injuries and ended up staying overnight at the hospital. This leads us to two important questions. Question 1. Did Andy No pose a threat on June 29, 2019, when Antifa attacked him? Yes. Yes, he did. It isn't the same threat as someone swinging at you with a fist or a baton, but it's a threat just the same. And it's a threat that needs to be answered in some way for the safety of activists in America alike. And wait, Fox, hold on, hold on, don't hang up, I'm getting the- <sighs> I'm never going to be rich. Question two. Does the threat posed by Andy No justify the beating, robbery, and milkshaking of June 29th? It does not. Violence against Andy No was not only morally wrong, it was strategically wrong. The debate over what constitutes free speech is as old as the concept itself. Mark Bray, author of the Anti-Fascist Handbook, argues that fascist speech is uniquely dangerous and should be suppressed by any means necessary, including through violence. His position, Antifa's position, is explicitly illiberal. And I'm honestly torn over the subject of actual fascist speech. The more I research fascist ideology, the more I suspect it's a sort of intellectual virus that degrades the believer's ability to perceive and interact with the real world. That's a topic for another video. But even if it's true that we should not tolerate certain kinds of fascist speech in our society, there has to be a very high bar on what constitutes intolerable speech. Andy No doesn't meet that bar. His lies help fascists, he's a shitty journalist, he's a grifter, and he's dangerous. But nothing he says rises to the level of fascist evil. His words should be resisted, but not violently suppressed. So, I'm morally against what happened to Andy No. Antifa should never have beaten him up. It was wrong. But even if I'm wrong in my moral condemnation, even if it turns out that Andy No absolutely deserved to be beaten up, it was still pragmatically wrong. For self-defense to work, it has to actually defend the self. This didn't. Andy knows beating was self-defense in the same way that attempts to repel a bear attack by hitting oneself in the eye is self-defense. Attacking Andy No was the worst thing Antifa could have possibly done that day, and subsequent events bear me out spectacularly. Hey, uh, you know what journalists don't like? Attacks on journalists. Even piss-poor dumpster fire journalists like Andy No. This story quickly became national news. The day after the attack, Noah appeared on several mainstream media outlets to talk about his beating and the resulting brain hemorrhage that has tragically affected both speech and memory. Luckily for him, these mental problems only seem to affect him while he speaks about his brain hemorrhage. And the CT scan at the hospital confirmed that I ha have a brain hemorrhage, and I've never had a brain injury, and 
it's only now, the more that I'm speaking, that I'm realizing, oh, there's certain minor deficiencies that I didn't realize while just laying in the hospital. Okay. Antifa in Portland. Portland, for your listeners who may not be aware, is a progressive monoculture, and it has a very large movement of far less radicals um, who call themselves anti-fascists. Presumably, if he just avoids that topic, he should be able to continue just fine. It's a medical miracle. The point is, this beating didn't neutralize No. In fact, the milkshaking has made him more effective in that role than ever before. No's Twitter following has nearly doubled since the incident, from 148,000 the day of the milkshaking to over 284,000 as of September 11th. A GoFundMe for his hospital expenses raised almost $200,000, and his legal defense fund has raised 61000 providing No with loads of funding for his future endeavors. The Black Bloc didn't just fail to shut No up, they handed him a microphone. But wait, there's more. Call within the next 20 minutes, and you can get Ted Cruz's bill to label Antifa as a domestic terrorist organization absolutely free. As I discussed in my last video, if passed, this bill could lead to the criminalization of any left-of-center protest. Also mentioned in my last video, within hours of nose beating, Joe Biggs announced his August 17th rally and his intention to kick the shit out of Antifa. So in no way did Andy nose beating discourage the far right from assembling in Portland. Quite the opposite. This isn't a unique failure of black bloc tactics either. The Berkeley riots of 2017 happened because Milo Yiannopoulos reportedly planned to name undocumented immigrants on campus and thus mark them for targeted harassment, a real threat. And the Black Bloc managed to stop Yiannopoulos' Berkeley speech, but they also catapulted him into the spotlight. The far right returned to Berkeley again and again, six times in seven months. Each battle resulted in more exposure and massive amounts of propaganda videos featuring newly infamous far-right figures like Kyle based Stickman Chapman and based Spartan. Every time, the news network spoke about the Milo protest that started it all. All this attention gave Milo and others an ever-growing platform for their douchebaggery. Remember when the Black Bloc threw an M-80 into the middle of the Patriot Prayer protest of June 30th, 2018, and set off a riot that resulted in perhaps the most viral conservative video of that year? Rem Remember Richard Spencer? Wait, what? Thought you were going to sneak that one past us, huh? Go ahead. Tell them why Spencer canceled his college speaking tour. Let's see you fit that into your little pacifist screed. <sighs> I'm not a pacifist, but you're right. Let's talk about Richard Spencer. When the Fuhrer says, We is the master race, we hire, hire, right in the Fuhrer's face, not to love the... Richard Spencer is... Does anyone not know who Richard Spencer is? Remember when we didn't know who Richard Spencer was? Ah, uh, those were the days. Oh well. One of the reasons everyone knows Richard Spencer is because of this- Obviously, I would be lying if I said I didn't enjoy this clip, and it did tarnish Spencer's cultivated image as some kind of powerful puppet master. It also resulted in a victim narrative and a huge spike in visibility for Spencer. Not awesome. However, this burst of viral exposure wasn't nearly as helpful for Spencer as it would prove for Milo and No later. For one thing, Spencer had already enjoyed a viral moment just a few months before, immediately following the 2016 election. For another, well... Hail Trump! Hail our people! Hail victory! <laughs> this guy is the best thing about this entire video. That look of, oh shit, I've been caught in a room full of Nazis is just... Well, it's a mood. So his previous viral moment didn't exactly win friends and influence people within mainstream American thought. Even though the punch increased his audience, that increase was less dramatic, and even though there was a lot of pontificating about freedom of speech in the aftermath of the punch, no one in the mainstream really had their heart in it. The true Black Bloc success story comes later, though, during Spencer's 2018 speaking tour. Antifa and the Black Bloc disrupted Spencer's speaking engagements, which both deterred attendance and inspired institutions to demand cripplingly high security fees. In the end, Spencer called it quits. The idea of the college tour was to engage with students, perhaps faculty, and for these things to be controversial and edgy, but also still fun. 
when they become violent clashes and pitched battles, they aren't fun. I really hate to say this, and, and I, I definitely hesitate to say this, but Antifa is... Antifa is winning. Flawless victory. Except, well, this was a very unique situation for a few reasons. What changed with Charlottesville? This is one of the few things people across the political spectrum agree on. Charlottesville changed everything. This was that rally with the, um, the torchlight parades, the Nazi flags, the sound of- The death of Heather Heyer. These things made it impossible for the world to pretend this was a normal, fun, patriotic little movement. Former allies distanced themselves. The whole thing exposed the truth of the alt-right movement, their actual ideas, their actual goals. Remember the impact of exposure. We're going to come back to that later. The fallout hit Spencer hard. No one outside the alt-right proper had any real sympathy for Spencer anymore. No one wanted to defend him, lawyers included. Spencer could not find a single lawyer in Virginia to defend him in court against charges stemming from the Charlottesville rally. Not even black bloc violence could transform Spencer into a sympathetic conservative martyr the way it did for Yiannopoulos and No. Not that any of this stopped Spencer from auditioning for the role, of course. The idea of the college tour was not to inspire uh, pitched battles between our side and the Antifa. Um, the Antifa weren't really a consideration when I thought of it. And, and certainly, I, 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 maybe I should have expected this, but I didn't expect the level of, of, of escalation that we've seen. Richard Spencer embarked on the speaking tour about a year and a half after the first Berkeley riots and immediately after Charlottesville. So when Spencer says he didn't expect violence, he is either stupid or a liar. This lie, which is blatant and ridiculous, makes more sense in retrospect when we recall that Spencer was secretly mired in expensive and messy divorce proceedings at that time. We learned that Spencer's wife, whom he had physically and emotionally abused for years, used the danger posed by Spencer's violent and provocative speaking events to argue for custody of the kids. So he had to pretend he'd never intended for them to get violent, and he had to find a face-saving way to stop his speaking tour if he wanted to see his kids again. Now, initially, this doesn't really look like saving face, but let's listen to the whole quote. Antifa is winning to the extent that they are willing to go further than anyone else in the sense that they will do things in terms of just violence, intimidation, general nastiness. They are willing to do things that no one else is willing to do. Kind of sounds like a call to arms or, you know, a call to legislation. Anyway, look, I'm glad he's mostly shut the hell up, because he is a very dangerous man with very dangerous ideas. And without a doubt, the stress that Black Bloc put on Spencer contributed in a big way to his semi-retirement. But if you're going to Black Bloc, you have to be damn sure the other guy comes out looking worse than you do. If he doesn't, congratulations, you've just created a martyr. You've created an Andy No. Part 4. Other Arguments Andy No and Milo Yiannopoulos cause just as much harm as Spencer in their own way. Nazis are bad and deserve to be punched in the face. How is this controversial? I don't like lumping everyone on the far right into the Nazi basket, but more than that, I really hate that word, deserve. What does it mean? What difference does it make? I'm not concerned with cosmic justice. I'm concerned with making the world a better and less fashy place. I'm not really interested in whether Milo or Andy or anyone else deserves to be punched. The core question is, what tactics most effectively neutralize the very real threat they pose? Well, historically, these tactics work really well. What about the successes in Britain and America during the punk movement? What about Canada and the Battle of Christie Pitts? Times have changed, man. Nazi punks were even more outside the mainstream than Richard Spencer. No one cried about their scrapes and bruises. The Battle of Christie Pitts was a direct response to long-standing violence and intimidation at the hands of fascist thugs. This go-round, the far-right is trying something different, respectability. 
They're portraying themselves as upstanding members of society instead of radical thugs. Cat Black has an outstanding video about this change. The point is, tactics that worked on skinheads and thugs, who appeared as outsiders, won't work on a far-right enemy that looks way more mainstream than your average Antifa member. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. You're missing the point of Black Block tactics. We make people afraid to join rallies and demonstrate in the street, which makes it harder for the fascists to spread their message. Make racists afraid again. There's some truth to the recruitment angle. The right-wing rally attendees I've talked to tell me they've had trouble convincing friends and family to attend rallies, primarily because of their fear of being assaulted or doxxed by Antifa. Also, though, a lot of those attendees I talked to went to their first rally after watching an Andy No-style video that shows black block violence against apparently innocent bystanders. You're deterring some people, but you're also helping them recruit. Also, this isn't the 80s, my dude. Back in the punk era, you could prevent ideas from spreading by shutting down physical meetings and destroying leaflets. We have the internet now, and these people can broadcast their views for free, no matter how many physical gatherings you disrupt. As an added bonus, they can broadcast you as you shut down these gatherings and paint you as enemies of free speech. Those people you deterred from attending rallies aren't neutralized, not even close. They're sitting at home, terrified of you, and they're going to vote accordingly. You've made them afraid, all right, and their fear makes them dangerous. A core element of fascism is the fear of some threatening and monstrous other. Why are you giving them that for free? You think if we stop punching Nazis, they're going to stop making propaganda and demonizing the left? Don't be naive. You already showed how most of these conservative outrage videos are made-up bullshit. They'll call us monsters no matter what we do. You're right, but black block bullshit makes it so much easier for them. True believers will feed their convictions with anything, lies very much included, but people who haven't already drunk the Kool-Aid are way more likely to see through total bullshit than propaganda based on real video footage that shows real leftist violence. For example, after the milkshaking incident, which was covered by everyone, some people on the far right claimed that Antifa planned to attack with acid in the future. Totally baseless bullshit. Far-right news outlets picked this story up and ran with it, but CNN did not. That matters. Alex Jones is right about one thing. This is an information war. We are fighting for the support of the people. If we don't accept that and keep treating this like a turf war, we'll never understand why we keep getting outclassed. Sure, there are concerns beyond the street, but the street matters too. The Black Bloc puts their bodies on the line to protect activists like you against far-right violence. You're fucking welcome. That's true, and thank you. Like I said, I'm not a pacifist. There's a time and a place for defensive violence. When the Black Bloc shows up to a Pride event or stands guard at a protest, that's community defense, and it's important work. Hell, my last video was 25 minutes of me explaining why a specific Black Bloc-style action was completely justified and probably saved lives. But sometimes black block violence isn't really defensive. Sometimes you choose your targets in a way that actually makes people less safe, like the Andy No incident or the destruction of property at Berkeley and during the Trump election protests. These things turn the public against the left and make future violence more likely without really protecting anyone. It's easy for you to sit there and say this shit. You're white passing. You come from a bougie background. You have hella privilege. Minorities don't have the luxury of gabbing on and on about respectability, politics, and strategy. They're justifiably afraid, and action like this makes them feel empowered. We need community solidarity. Well, first off, that's a false dichotomy. Do you really expect me to believe that only black bloc tactics can generate community solidarity? But more importantly, if these tactics ultimately put the most vulnerable members of our society at risk by increasing the reach of far-right ideas, I don't care how much solidarity it generates. I'm sorry, but we need to get our priorities straight. We need to fight this smart, or we're going to lose a lot more than our sense of empowerment. <sighs> Look, Antifa Bollard, the truth is I like you. Your people are the only ones who take the fascist creep as seriously as I do, and I think your heart is in the right place. But these tactics are putting us all at risk, and we need to talk about it. I'm not the only person on the left side of things who feels this way, but a lot of us refuse to talk about it in the name of solidarity. And while it's true that we already have way too much infighting on the left, it's also true that we are in a very precarious situation in America right now, and we cannot afford to fuck this up. If you really care about fighting fascism, and I believe that you do, then you'll be willing to re-examine your tactics you'll be willing to consider that there might be a better way to win. 
Yeah, well, this whole thing is just a massive straw man anyway. I have way better arguments for punching Nazis than the ones you've had me use. Well, I did my best. Go ahead and leave your other arguments in the comments. Oh, believe me, I will. Honestly, dude, I know you mean well, but this kind of criticism gets really old. Everyone loves to criticize black bloc tactics, but we're out here laying it on the line to fight fascism. People spend all their time complaining about how we're doing it wrong, and none of their time fighting back against the real enemy. So tell me, what's your big plan for pushing back against the far right? That's a fair question. I've seen the kind of concern trolling you're talking about, and that's definitely not what I'm going for. I think a lot of centrists and liberals focus on Antifa's occasionally inappropriate activities because it's a lot less scary to yell at people for punching a guy than it is to yell at a group that churns out mass shooters and hate crimes at a horrifyingly consistent rate. Since 2018, far-left activists have been responsible for exactly zero extremist murders in America. Nearly 100% of those murderers came from the far right. Hate crimes have steadily risen for the past five years across America, even as the overall crime rate falls. In Oregon, it went up 125%. It's important to remember that even if every single violent or aggressive thing Antifa has ever done was inappropriate, unprovoked, and morally wrong, not the case, the damage would still pale in comparison to the violence perpetrated with increasing frequency by far-right actors. It's because I take the far-right threat so seriously that I want to be sure we're using the right tactics to fight back. There are a lot of things we can start doing and a lot of things we're already doing that we can do more of that don't feed the conservative outrage machine the way block block tactics can and do. And I would love to go into those right now, but y'all, we just passed the 30 minute mark and my second video ever cannot be an hour long. I'll die, you'll die, we'll all die. Give me two weeks. My next video will talk about several specific effective ways to push back against the fascist creep without throwing a single punch. Two weeks. Well, uh, maybe three. See you soon.